if something's going to happen, it's going to happen in the winter on a bad day. There's been bullets, it's been, it's been injured board boat, killed board boat, washed overboard, boat sunk. Working in the wintertime in the Gulf, we're up against some really harsh conditions, some freezing conditions, some strong winds. It's tough to say it hard. It's cold up here, or the wind blows up here, the wind chills bad, so, you know, you gotta have people that are robust and got a kind of a passion to come do it. Hello, I'm Tom Murphy. Welcome to Land and Sea. Winters here in the Maritimes can be, well, let's just say an adventure. Freezing temperatures, gale force winds, ferocious storms, we get it all. Most of us just try to get through it, but there are those whose jobs demand they tackle winter head on. They are out there making a living in often harsh and sometimes dangerous conditions. On a cold winter afternoon in southwestern Nova Scotia, John Boudelier and the crew of the Maritime Harvester leave the safe confines of Port Latour Harbor to fish for lobster far from shore. Each one of these purple dots is a string of our gear. We got 250 pots. We got 15 pots in the string, so we got uh, 17 strings of gear to haul. Leaving now at a time of day when most people are sitting down to Sunday dinner means they will haul those pots in the middle of the night, 65 kilometers out to sea. But in winter, when the storms hit hard and often, the weather dictates your every move. He's blowing now these easterly wind for, for the last week and a half, so this here's the first chance we get to go. It's only, and it's only a small window really, it's only, you only gonna get the one day out of it, and then there's another northeaster coming, so. With all this stormy weather, Boudelier is worried about his traps. Been talking to Polis and their, their gear has been snarled up, and some gear, some Polis, their gear's all right, and other Polis said it's worst, worst mess they've seen, so. Finally, after steaming for more than four hours, the crew prepares to haul the first line. By now, the temperature has dropped below freezing. It's dark, it's wet, and it's cold. Mm -hmm. Well, for the first train, we only have one little hicker on the end of it. Looking good. Prior scenario wise, anyways. Shy on the lobsters. Shy on lobsters is something Boudelier will say a lot this night. A lot of traps are near empty. Still, there's a lot of money to be made out here. Nova Scotia's winter lobster fishery is the most lucrative in the country. But it's also one of the most dangerous fisheries. Every winter, more than 100 fishermen are injured on these raucous seas. And over the past five years, 15 fishermen have lost their lives. Pretty well know somebody that's had pretty well everything happen to them, really. Like, been followed as a been injured board boat, killed board boat, washed overboard, boat sunk, catch fire, whatever. Bootlier hasn't just heard those stories, he's lived them. Years ago, a boat he was on sank. The crew spent four hours in a life raft waiting for rescue. Not a good feeling, for sure. I mean, big, big seas, a lot of wind, and you're in a, in a life raft trying to save your life, I guess. And then a few years ago, another accident. In high winds, a rogue wave slammed his boat onto its side. I broke my tailbone and tore me, tore my legs all up to pieces. Like I was in the hospital for a month, so I was laid up for six months. And doctors were telling telling me I wouldn't, I wouldn't work again. And, and here I am, I guess. Lobster fishermen don't like to talk about the dangers they face every time they go out. For deckhands Mark Harris and Matthew Morash. It's just another job. Fell overboard there one time. Uh, they got me back pretty quick. Wasn't too bad, I guess. A little chilly, but. Does it deter you from keep doing it? I'm here, ain't I? Pretty much anybody can go lost, and I guess. As long as you can stand a little bit of cold, a few hours, don't get sick. <laughs> 
It's a job that only pays when they're out catching lobster, so there is immense pressure on the captain. It's his decision to either go out to face the weather or to stay home. It's a hard call to make in the, in the winter time, and the way the winter is now, it's, it's getting worse and worse. Storms are more violent. I mean, just here lately, I mean, when you're talking 10, 10 15 meter seas, that's getting up there. I mean, I don't recall seeing that years ago. Like, you got six, seven meter seas, you had something then, but now every time you turn around, you got 10 meter seas on your doorstep. As the night wears on, the damage caused by the most recent storms gets worse. More snarled gear, some traps cut right off. The night is not going good. As dawn breaks, there's more bad news. So right now we're just looking for a couple of strings that we couldn't find in the dark. Booze have probably gone off them from chafing in the storm, so see if we can round them up before we go home, I guess. In the end, they don't find the missing trap lines. 45 traps gone. Another 14 so badly snarled with someone else's gear, they couldn't haul them. That's a quarter of his gear. Still, Bootlier says he wouldn't want to do anything else. It's just something that draws you, draws you to the water, I guess. And I mean, it, my father, he was a fisherman, and I mean, it's all fishing communities around here, so it just seems to be the place the place to be, I guess. I, I don't know anything else I'd rather do. Coming up, carving a path through the frozen seas. So the biggest challenge of uh, being on board these ships is uh, just working in the harsh conditions. On a gray winter day off the coast of Prince Edward Island, Captain Stefan Legault pilots the Coast Guard icebreaker Sir William Alexander through the Northumberland Strait. Today we're tasked to go into Summerside and break out the ice that's in the harbour. We've got a ship coming in in a couple of days, so we're just going to prep the harbour for their entrance so it's safe. This is what they are facing. Summerside Harbor is frozen solid. Nothing can move in or out of here. And without the help of the icebreaker, it could stay icebound for weeks. Hello, William Alexander, Northumberland Traffic, go ahead. Um, we're just Paula passing call in point two. Uh, ETA to the Confederation Bridge is 15 minutes over. To get to Summerside, the ship has to sail under the Confederation Bridge, the 13 kilometer span that links Prince Edward Island to the mainland. When the ice is in, this can be a treacherous passage, but today it's smooth sailing. As the Alexander approaches the ice-covered harbour, Captain Legault and his crew finalize their plan of attack. So the outer bay here where the ice is will be able to do a semicircle, which will just uh, dislodge that one piece of ice. The wind should do the rest of the work for us. Uh, once we've got that broken out, then we can proceed into Summerside and uh, just break out the, uh, the channel, the narrow channel for the ship to get in. It may look like the icebreaker is simply cutting its way through the ice, but in reality, it's the weight of the ship rising and falling that breaks it apart. When you get into the heavier ice, you'll actually feel the bow moving up and then falling down over the ice, and that's what breaks it. Uh, when you get into some really heavy ice, uh, she will actually ride up quite a ways and if you don't get through it the first time, she'll ride up and slide backwards and then you've just got to start over again, back up and go through it until uh, you get through it. Plowing through a field of solid ice takes a lot of power. The Alexander has three engines that can crank out 7,000 horsepower and sometimes they need every ounce of it. Uh, yes, uh, third officer, it's the chief engineer here. Can you uh, pull the sticks back, please, so we can uh, put a third engine on? Darren Ackerman is the ship's chief engineer. When we're, when we're steaming along, if we're going through, you know, just an, a normal ice, we can go along a lot on two engines. But if we get into anything heavier, we'll go with three to give us full power. 
and we have um, we have situations like we had one here recently. Uh, we were steaming along with three engines on, uh, full speed, full power, and we were making about one to two knots through the ice. Normally, through open water with three engines on, we'll make close to 15 knots. So we were we were severely restricted with the, from the pressure of the ice. That pressure means the icebreaker needs to be designed and built to work in extreme conditions. Conditions regular ships just can't handle. We have a, a purposely shaped bow that uh, comes down from the bow to, to a point, like to, to a knife almost, like an ice knife. That allows us to sometimes, if we get in heavier pans of ice, we'll, we'll hit the ice and it'll, uh, it'll actually help us break it. Also on the stern we have uh, an ice horn which actually helps us to protect our rudder uh, if we're steaming, if we're backing up in the ice. Because if we, we may come to a spot of ice where we have to stop or the vessel gets stopped, then we'll back up again. We may back up half a mile and go forward again and, and hit the pressure ridge. Sometimes simply cutting a path into port isn't enough. These icebreakers are often called on to escort ships through miles and miles of ice, a job that brings its own dangers. When we're escorting in the ice, uh, the ships are relatively close behind us, uh, about a mile to eight cables, which doesn't sound that close, but in the ship industry, we don't stop all that quickly either. Uh, the danger is always for if we get slowed down or stuck in front of them, and then they have to stop or veer out of our track uh, so they don't strike us from behind. The Sir William Alexander is one of eight Coast Guard icebreakers that work the Atlantic region, ensuring ferries and cargo ships keep moving all year round, no matter what the weather. Working in the wintertime in the Gulf, uh, we're up against some really harsh conditions, uh, some freezing conditions, some strong winds. Um, when you do get out in the open water, you've got freezing spray also, so you try and mitigate uh, that so that you're not freezing up the, the decks. Harsh conditions that crew members Tim Fitzgerald and Darren Studley have seen and worked in all too often. We were working up in the Gas Bay, Quebec area, and we run into some pretty rough weather conditions, so we took a lot of ice. Well, iced up a lot on the forward deck here, so probably six, six to ten inches of ice here, and we ended up probably spending about a week cleaning it all off with ice malls, shovels, picks, whatever we had, right? A lot of work. It's hard on the body, for sure. And it's a struggle we really work for when we uh, get iced up. On this day, the weather conditions for winter are almost ideal. The Alexander makes swift work of clearing a path through the Summerside Harbor for the cargo ship that's due here in a day or two. Basically when the ship comes in, this is the wharf he's gonna go alongside of. So this is the turning basin. So we come in here on our first track, then we backed up and got all the way around and now we're just coming around again. Uh, we're trying to break up just everything in here so the ice will have somewhere to move and that way he'll be able to get alongside the wharf with with no problem. With this job almost done, the crew of the Sir William Alexander prepare to head out to sea with a sense of satisfaction and zero one zero. ready to take on their next assignment wherever they are needed, in whatever conditions winter throws at them. Well, at the end of the day, you can see that you've accomplished something, right? You see the ice all broken up, you see it heading out the harbor. Well, it, there is a certain sense of accomplishment with that, right? And it's, it's playing, right? playing with the ship and it's, uh, it's fun. Coming up. Tonight we're going down to minus eight, so that's, that's really good. Creating their own winter playground. You can't be out here if you don't like to be outside and be in the cold and deal with uh, whatever mother nature can throw at you. It's the middle of December and Ski Martok in Windsor, Nova Scotia is ready for another season. Inside the lodge, manager Andy McLean has everything stacked, ready to hit the slopes. Well, you know, we've got 700 pairs of skis and a little over 300 snowboards sitting here just waiting for snow, so ready to go. 
snow. The one thing a ski resort can't live without. Here in the Maritimes, our fickle winter weather means ski operators can't rely solely on Mother Nature. The only way to make it here is to give the old lady a helping hand. So this is our new snow guns. This is what we make our man-made snow with. Jim Boylan, who along with his wife Heather owns Ski Martok, oversees their snowmaking operation. A complex system that requires dozens of snow guns, thousands of meters of hoses, compressed air and lots and lots of water. The gun runs on 500 pounds pressure of water and 100 psi of air. So the air is pumped into the gun, the water is pumped into the gun from the hydrants. The water and the air mix inside this head, comes out through these nozzles. The snow guns, about 75 in all, are positioned all along the main run, like soldiers standing guard ready for action. But the guns are useless unless the temperature drops. Mother Nature decides not to give us cold weather, then, you know, we can only make snow, say, up to minus two. Then after that, you make water. Finally, a few days later, they get what they need. The mercury drops below freezing, and it's expected to stay cold for several days. So, yeah. uh, we should be able to get her all rocking and rolling tonight because it's supposed to drop down to minus eight. So we'll get her going full tilt. See so if we can get 2,000 gallons a minute going here and get this place up and going. Sounds good to me. The snowmaking crew, led by Boylan's son Josh, have to turn on and check each of the dozens of snowmaking guns on the hill. This is what we need and this is what we've been waiting for. And like the window's opportunity for making snow is getting smaller and smaller. So we got to grab the bull by the horns and go when we get a chance to go. Tonight's going to be good. And it is a good night. In just a few short hours, the snow is starting to pile up on the hill's main run. That's good. Really good, actually. The amount of time we've been going, probably putting a half of snow in some of those piles there. So by morning, you know, it should be really impressive. So it's good, really good. There we go. That's a good, good dense snowball. Uh, good quality snow, that's what we're looking for. Not too wet, but the water's running out of it, but it's freezing good by the time it hits the ground. As long as the weather stays cold, the snowmaking crews will work non-stop, constantly checking and moving the snow guns to get maximum coverage. We have uh, two crews, two 12-hour shifts, uh, four or five guys on a shift. Uh, they're up here every two hours doing checks on the snow guns to make sure nothing's freezing up, hoses aren't getting buried. You get a big wind blowing up here in the night like tonight, it's blowing pretty good, right? It doesn't take long so that the hoses can be covered up and then it's a big job. So if you don't stay on top of it all the time, then it causes you, you more grief, more work. Working all night in a blizzard of your own making, with the wind howling and the temperature well below zero, isn't for everyone. But for Josh Boylan and Mitch Richard, it beats working in an office. Oh yeah, you can't be out here if you don't like to be outside and be in the cold and deal with uh, whatever Mother Nature can throw at you. Every night's different, the wind's always changing. We like it when it's colder. You gotta love winter and you don't have to mind the cold temperatures. And I don't know, it's just the way it is, really. But the winter, if you want everyone to be able to ski and have fun, this is what we gotta do to give them the fun. <laughs> It's, it's not for the faint of heart. This is very physical work. It's cold up here, or the wind blows up here, the wind chills bad. So, you know, you gotta have people that are robust and got a kind of a passion to come do it. Not everybody will come and make snow. And owning a ski resort in the Maritimes isn't for the faint of heart either. Making enough snow to get this hill open will cost Boyland hundreds of thousands of dollars in water, power, and labor costs money he knows could easily melt away if the weather suddenly turns warmer. Uh, a few years ago here we were getting ready to open, we had pumped 14 million gallons of water and that was a lot of water that would have given us a couple of trails. The night before we were going to open up, the green come in, lost about 10 million gallons of it. So then you start all over again. Fortunately for now anyway, the weather has stayed cold. As dawn breaks a few days later, the main run is almost ready to open. But there is still lots of work to do. The snow guns have created huge piles of snow, 
piles that will have to be leveled and groomed into a ski run. Beautiful. This looks absolutely wonderful. The boys made a lot of production last night. The cold temperature, we had minus 14 here last night, so it really made a nice bunch of snow. With this trail almost done, the crews will move all the snow guns to the next trail and start the process all over again. It's a huge investment of time, money and resources, all for a business that lives and dies on our unpredictable maritime winter. If you stop and think too much about it, you wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, like I say, it's labor, labor love, so you gotta have a passion to kind of want to do it, but it's, I compare it to farming, right? And, you know, you gotta make hay when the sun shines and we're just farming snow is what we're doing here, right? So I don't think there's a whole lot of money in farming either, these days, but there's not a whole lot of money in the ski industry too, so. But it's something we love doing, so that's where we come from, what we do. That feeling, that passion, is something that is shared by many of those who choose to tackle winter and everything it throws at us head on. The best thing about this job is just being out here providing the service. If, uh, if anybody's in distress, needs our assistance, well, we're going out to help them. I don't know, it's just a, a lot of time it's the thrill of being out here and other times it's just, the, I don't know, so peaceful, I guess. Couldn't think of anything else I'd rather do. Like, love it. <laughs>